commission meeting for the evening of October 25th. Sorry. <laughs> um, so if we could really quick just do a Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Um, will you go ahead and do roll call? Commissioner Ferguson? Here. Commissioner Michelle? Here. Commissioner Nesbitt? Here. Commissioner H. Wiley? Here. Commissioner L. Wiley? Here. Chair McLean? Here. Thank you. Um, for those who wish to speak tonight, please remember to address all comments and questions to the chair. Keep your comments brief and on point. And if you agree with the previous comment, simply indicate your agreement and move on. To expedite tonight's meeting, I will ask all of those who wish to testify uh, to please stand and be sworn in. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth before this commission? If so, say I do. I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, first thing on our agenda is the consent agenda. So commissioners, I'll ask you to look over the minutes. And then again, if there's anything you want to pull out and discuss separately, we can do that. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, case 22320-04, like I pulled up to talk about. You want to pull that one out and talk about it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so let's discuss the minutes. If anybody has any changes or if they look good. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion we approve the minutes or consent agenda. Okay. Motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. And we're ready for a vote. <coughs> Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner H. Wiley? Yes. Commissioner L. Wiley? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. The minutes have been approved. Um, next thing on the agenda then will be the um, case 22-320-04, final plat for Cargo Largo replat request by Dan Jensen for a final plat, plat at 131,900 East 35th Street. Madam Chair, um, I've been having a problem with this plat for a while here. I don't know if it has anything, if anything can be done, but I'd like to postpone approval for this until we can get an answer from staff about the intersection of 35th and Knowles. Um, They've told us before that there's something on here to fix 35th and Nolan because we got a truck that's going to be coming in now there, and the right the turn radius is not good on the southwest corner, and basically somebody's going to get hurt or killed there. I have watched trucks recently go to go in and out of there that um, there's pedestrians stand there, and that uh, they're going to get hit by it. I, the person had to back up to keep from getting hit by the semi. You can also see where the semi marks are on the on the turn radius there on the street pole so and then we also gonna have nobody's considered 35th street i mean nolan road if they get more than two semis backed up there they're going to be on nolan road so then our traffic's going to get backed up we did have a traffic survey done survey done said that there's going to be considerable increase but they didn't know what to start it at it was they never had a starting point it's going to increase by i can't remember now it wasn't extensive. I mean, we had an extensive traffic study that all of us read, all of us approved. Right. Yeah, I know you all approved it, but I'm saying I don't think everybody realizes that how many more trucks or semis are going to be coming in there. I mean, there's going to be a lot of semis come in there daily. Right now, they say, I think it was 30% increase, I think it was, and basically 30, but they didn't know what the starting point was. If it's 10, that's going to be 30 a day. That's going to be there. And we're going to have a whole lot more 
trucks in there. I'm just saying that radius needs to be fixed and also Nolan Road needs to be fixed because I've asked the staff about it and nobody has anything. They said it was on there, but I have not seen anything in writing anywhere. I see where they're going to fix 35th and Lane Court, where they're going to fix 33rd and Nolan Road. Basically, tax money of like 1.7 million is going to be done by the Nolan Road Improvement Six. District, but I don't see anything where we've had anything fixed on this aspect. Do you mean 39th Street or 35th? 35th. Because basically, semis are going to come up to 35th, turn in to go into Cargo Largo, just like what they do to go into um, Lipton area. Well, it's not Lipton, Unilever. That's their in and out assets, access point there. So, I mean, we've talked to council about it. They've talked to uh, council members about it, but nobody's ever given me an answer yet. So I'm thinking we need to get this fixed before it starts happening. That's where I'm saying. That's the only reason I have a problem with it. It's just we're going to get an increase of semis, and we don't have a fix for it yet. I just ask that it goes back to staff and see if they can come up with an answer to have this fixed, or if there is one. Does anyone else have any other comments? I, I don't or remember that they were going, the trucks were going to come in and out of the 35th uh, by the old Cargo Largo. I thought that they were going to come in the other way. Other way from where? Yeah. From 39th Weatherby Street. Weatherby from the back. 39th Street? Or, no, or no uh, what is that? Weatherby. Weatherby. Staff. Weatherby. Uh -huh. 33rd. 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 And Weatherby also. And Weatherby. Yep. That's what I thought the traffic study was. was. I never knew about the going in on 35th. Well, I mean, that's how the trucks go right now to Unilever's well, 30. Yeah. yeah. They do I mean, that's, that, then basically, that needs to be addressed, too. I mean, we need to get that intersection fixed. But I'm saying because it's going to be more than just semis. We're going to have trucks with trailers, people, when they come to pick up their parts and this, their winnings, basically, they're going to have trailers that they'll come out of there. If they don't know that race, they're going to be running over the edge, running over the sign, or running over people. Staff, can you remind me of the traffic? So when, and I, I don't recall the specific numbers or the percentages, but when this traffic study came through, the purpose of the 33rd Street or the new access point there, there there's a preemptive signal so the purpose of the preemptive signal was to prevent people from getting stuck in that intersection in the event of a train crossing. That's the, that's the preemptive part of that signal. And so when they looked at the study, the 35th Street was one we can kind of consider it a little bit outside the scope of that project um, because it's not just Cargo Largo that uses 35th Street. Right, yeah. And, um, the bulk of their traffic, their new traffic, was intended to go down 35th Street through Weatherford, which is why they're putting the larger intersection on Weatherford as it enters kind of the back of their building, because that's where the majority of their tra traffic is. Okay, wait a minute, Rick, you said 35th. You mean 33rd or 35th? 33rd. Okay, 33rd. 33rd. Okay. Yeah. Is, isn't 33rd the, the new one across from Truman? Yes. I thought that was prim primarily going to be for public access, not for truck no, access. No, that can't be. Yeah, that, that's not well, third it's, third. Well, it's wide enough for truck access. It's mm -hmm. got the radius for it. Because I remember having the conversation during the original right. case that public was intended to go in on 33rd. The trucks were intended to go back by the library around the rear. And then we even stipulated that even though you know, the rest of us who know how to get back there will be taking the back way from Chrysler that's what I right. and others. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, the traffic study supported that that the there would not be, you know, the scientific analysis that there was not there was not going to be an issue based on everything that they were going to do. Well, there's no issue on it. It's just the turn radius is not big enough because they're already running over it, and they're also running over the curb on thir on Nolan Road because they got to swing out to swing around it. I mean, there's already been problems already happening. That's why we just need to get this fixed before it gets worse. That's what I'm saying. So there were intersection improvements also on Weatherford and 35th. Yeah, Weatherford and 35th, yeah, yeah. that's up on up the road yeah. there by the library. But the intent, so obviously right now the current Cargo Largo is still in operation, and so right. the intent yeah. was to switch that building 
I think mostly for administrative, don't quote me on that, but I know they're uh, looking at the different use for that. That's kind of their second phase. So again, the, the bulk of that is kind of in the rear of their new building, so. Well, they're probably gonna use the front of it still as their everyday at, uh, sales, and then that warehouse is gonna be their bid system that they're taking off Front Street and bringing up here. Yeah, I mean, as far as specific use, uh, right. other well, than I'm just that, more worried about the intersection of 35th and Nolan. I'm just saying we don't have anything to address that. But we, we did have we did address it in the in the traffic study when we had the original case, and now none of us have the traffic study in well, front of us, and so I I'm not comfortable discussing a traffic study that all of us went over a year ago. I mean, it I don't. It made sense at the time. It, yeah, and and is this final plat different than than the? So what this final plat does is it adjusts Weatherford Road to what the actual design. Uh, radiuses were on Weatherford Road, so it, it adjusts it slightly, kind of in the middle, the curves, what we call the uh, horizontal curve of Weatherford. So that's what this plat adjusts, is to make sure that that road is within the right of way. Okay, so this addresses the problem. Well, no, no, this has nothing to do with the intersection. This just oh, okay. has to do with the alignment of Weatherford. Okay. Uh, and that's the longer road that kind of goes along the backside. Right. And so what was originally submitted has slightly different uh, horizontal curves. And so that just needs to be reflected on the right of way. Okay. But that's what this is. That's easy. Yeah. Okay. Any more discussion or I would entertain a motion? on case number 22-320-04, the final plat. Anybody wanna make a motion? Or Madam Chair. I'm still thinking. <laughs> I move to approve case 22-320-04, final plat for cargo largo replat. Thank you, is there a second? I second. Thank you, Commissioner Michelle, okay. We will, we're ready, we're ready for a vote. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? No. Commissioner H. Wiley? Yes. Commissioner L. Wiley? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. Case number 22-320-04, final plat for cargo largo replat has um, been approved. Okay, um, then case number 22-100-13, rezoning for 17007 East US 40 Highway has been withdrawn. So we will not be talking about that one tonight. Um, I had to catch up here. So the next case will be case 22-100-18, rezoning of 9300 East US 24 Highway. Staff, we're ready for a report. Yes, this is an application for Jennifer Belbasi. I hope I said that right. For uh, rezoning some property at 24 Highway and Independence Avenue. As you can see there on the vicinity map, it is a part of a triangle piece of ground uh, right where uh, 24 Highway goes to the southeast, Independence Highway goes straight, and uh, Brookside Avenue also cuts through there in that, in a vertical fashion there. They're seeking to rezone this property at that intersection, and we'll go on to the next slide. This is the surrounding zoning, so the applicant's property is in the sort of pinkish triangle there in the middle of the screen. Uh, Independence Avenue is on top again, 24 highways on the south, and then Brookside is on the west. Uh, the applicants actually came in a few months ago and wanted to make improvements to this uh, gasoline station and uh, staff did a little research and we discovered the property was still zoned R12, two family dwelling. We went back and researched the, uh, the last two zoning maps that we had that, were, that we knew that were 100% accurate from November 1965 and May 1980 
and indeed the property was owned R12. So the applicant uh, applied to rezone the property to C2. Uh, this uh, gas station has been operating on this uh, little over a third of an acre lot at this intersection for well over 50 years from my understanding of talking to some longtime residents of the city. She, she recently purchased this property and approached the city staff again wanting to remodel and uh, modernize the store on the east side of the site. And then they applied to rezone the property. <clears throat> this is an aer uh, aerial photograph of the property. It's a triangle shape you can see in the uh, magic marker dark, dark line around the outside. There's a small uh, store on the right side and then there's uh, three sets of pumps out in the uh, to the west of the store. <clears throat> Again, it's a small triangular piece of ground. Uh, it has a roughly 25 by 36, cent, 36 foot retail building that sits on the east side of the site with three gas stations west of the store. It's, if you've been out there, it's virtually flat it's a, and covered with uh, pavement except for a few grass areas around the perimeter. Uh, access to 24 Highway, there's two curb cuts on 24 Highway as you can see there, on the north on Independence Avenue, basically it's open for most of its width there, except for a, an island in the middle and the rest of it's open. <clears throat> While the uh, proposed zoning of C2 for this property is consistent with the recommended residential neighborhood land use designation outlined by the plan, realistically it's unlikely to be used for residential purposes. This property is also noted in the 2006 24 Highway Corridor study as part of the site for a redevelopment opportunity sandwiched between the Mount Washington Gateway area and the Winter Road 24 Highway intersection revitalization location. <clears throat> Again, this is a comprehensive plan that shows this is a neighborhood residential. <clears throat> okay, here we're looking east at the front of the site to the east at the front of the site. Again, there's a little store off in the distance. There's three sets of pumps, one under the canopy and then two to the right that are uh, open. This is a side view of the location. Again, the, the small store there on the right and the gas pumps there on the left. That's a commercial building on the, on the right there. <clears throat> this is the, commercial, the edge of the commercial building that was shown on the last slide. This is it. I don't know what the history of this is or what's in there exactly, but it's been commercial for a long time. And this is zoned commercial. Just that triangle piece has been zoned R12. Uh, here we're looking <coughs> east down US 24 Highway. If you've been out there, you know how this looks. Uh, we're in one of the driveways that lead into the site. This is uh, looking south across 24 Highway. That's part of the property that's owned by the cemetery. And this is a little, uh, now a, a bus stop that I understand was previously a trolley stop. That's, that's looking to the, uh, looking to the west down the 24 highway. <clears throat> and then this is a building that was, that's directly west of the site before it was a contracting company for a, uh, HVAC company, it was a Dairy Queen, and before that I think it was uh, some other sort of restaurant. And then there is a small church just north of the site across Independence Avenue. <clears throat> Staff does recommend approval of this rezoning request. Thank you. I remember the Dairy Queen, but I didn't know about the trolley. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, would the applicant please come up? And state your full name and your address, please. Oh, I'm Jenny Belbasi. Um, I live on 8325 West 120 Terrace, Overland Park, Kansas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just tell us anything you would like us to know. Well, we've been running this building since 2018, and we just got the property and planning to be able to modernize the building. You know, the building is very old, it's coming apart. <laughs> So I came with a surprise that we need to reason the building to be able to make the improvements. We, the store is just too small for storage. Sometimes, you know, the delivery guys leave uh, stuff outside. We need to keep cleaning. The trash is in a um, part of the building that is very difficult to access. So we just need to be able to 
just make it a little bit bigger on both sides to be able to have more um, room for storage and put more um, refrigerators inside and a bigger bathroom. That sounds great. Fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> the bathroom is just for one very, very, very <laughs> tiny. It is little. Yeah, it is very little. Um, commissioners, any questions? Um, Madam Chair, I think I read this, but I just want clarification from staff that truly the reason for some of this rezoning is to correct the zoning. Clean up in aisle seven. So That's correct. Aisle. We're trying to uh, fix an error that went back, I don't know, 50 years or more. I don't know the history of it. It was, he was on that way in uh, what, 1965, and my guess it was probably that way before. Yeah. But when you get back into the early 60s, the zoning of the city gets kind of sketchy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? I did hear you. So the, the corridor improvement does go all the way down past her, correct? Do you mean the one that MoDOT is doing? Yeah. No, it does no. not go to this site. Okay. It does not go this far. I believe it stops, uh, well, River. it says in the report. 291 and River. Oh, does yeah, that, that's rude. right. East of, east of here. Okay. All right. I do have another question yeah. then. I do believe, um, just to ask, ask you, um, you did mention that this was part of the revitalization plan so are you talking about something different, something different. Uh, what we had uh, we had a case a couple months ago uh, that it was in an area of 24 highway where they're actually doing sidewalk and trail and driveway improvements that project does not go to this far but it was talked about in an earlier case completely different all right thank you still an improvement <laughs> All right, thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Commissioners, any more questions of staff or discussion? I'm going to close. Oh, wait. Is there anyone here who would like to speak for this case? Is there anyone here who would like to speak against this case? Hearing none, the public portion of this case is closed. Commissioners, is there any more discussion, questions of staff, or I would entertain a motion? Madam Chair? Yes. I make a motion that we approve case 22-100-18. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. And we're ready for a vote. <coughs> Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner H. Wiley? Yes. Commissioner L. Wiley? Yes. Chair McLean? Yes. Case number 22-100-18, rezoning of 9300 East U.S. 24 Highway, has been approved. Best of luck. And thank you for uh, alerting us so we could clean up our zoning. Feels good. Okay, next case is case 22-810-02, preliminary development plan at approximately 4505 Little Blue Parkway. Ready for a report. Yes, this is an application by the Mid-Continent Public Library to build a, a new branch at the uh, corner of Heartland Avenue or Heartland Drive and of the Little Blue Parkway. As you can see from the uh, vicinity map uh, where its location is. It's easy to say that it's across from the new apartment complex out there at uh, Little Blue Parkway, along Little Blue Parkway, and then uh, it's also south of the Eastland Center, which is uh, on the other side of the drive, on the other side of Little Blue Parkway. This is the surrounding zonings for the site. Uh, to the uh, to the west, across the Little Blue Parkway, is some property that is zoned multifamily, even though it's actually a church. And then to the, uh, to the, I guess you call it to the northeast, is the apartment complex, which is actually zoned for office. And then there's commercial property along where the, uh, uh, the 
the restaurant, the corner cafe, and uh, uh, the hospital, the children's hospital is. Uh, to the south uh, is the mobile home park that's actually zoned agriculture. And then there's some uh, meandering property that's owned by the county as part of the Little Blue Trees Park that has various zonings. The church to the south east of the site is actually zoned multifamily as well. This is the aerial photograph of the site. Again, you can see the apartment complex is just newly completed there. Uh, the red triangle shows the uh, ground to be basically undeveloped. It's, uh, it has a heavy tree line along the south. The northern part is uh, brush covered somewhat with some open areas. Again, to the south, you have the mobile home park. And then to the southeast, you have uh, the church, as you can see. And then across the little blue parkway, you have the church complex. And then there's also a uh, uh, senior housing thing directly west of the site. Hmm. Don't know what happened to our thing here. Just a minute. We're back. <laughs> now here's the comprehensive plan. This entire area is <coughs> designated as mixed use. Again, the uh, pinkish triangle shows the uh, location of the site and the property around it. <coughs> okay, this, this site along with the other land in, along the Little Blue Parkway corridor was annexed in the city in the mid 70s with an agriculture zoning. <coughs> Later, sometime in the 80s, the uh, Tri-City Ministry had a plan for the site along with the other lands along there that they owned. Uh, the idea, and it was owned RP3, which was moderate density multifamily. <coughs> and later received, they later received a special use permit to have a group home for the disabled there, but it was never constructed. <coughs> Since the property was annexed into the city, the site has received little development activity. From the high point on the west side of the site, it slopes to the east with the low point being in the southeast corner of the five and a half acre site. Small stream, stream and a significant tree cover exist along the south half of the property. <coughs> Mid-Continent Library seeks to construct its Eastern Independence Branch at this location. The library building is a, proposed to be 12,770 square feet, multi-sided uh, structure facing Heartland Drive. <clears throat> the exterior of the building will consist of gray brick veneer composing most of its sides with a tan vertical wall siding and complementing complement composite cladding on the north elevations. Windows are also being employed on the south and west elevations. A feature incorporated with this branch's design is a drive through window on its south elevation. With a lot area of over five acres, the branch has room to expand. <coughs> Here we can see the uh, location uh, in the site plan. Again, uh, at the top of the screen is the intersection of Heartland Drive and Little Blue Parkway. Uh, you come down the street and there's the drive entrance uh, that exit that, uh, that enters the site. Uh, parking is on the right. The library is to the west slightly there. The drive-through is immediately adjacent to the building on the south side, or I guess that would be east side. It's at an angle here. So uh, staff is, uh, they did show a second drive onto this, uh, onto this uh, design originally. Uh, staff is uh, not recommending in favor of this drive. We believe it should be removed. <coughs> Here's the elevations of the building. Uh, because the building is a slightly uh, polygon shape, there's uh, multiple elevations. Uh, again, the, you have the, the top elevation that's on the right is the actual 
side of the building that has the drive through that little black box that you see there is actually the drive through window. And then the other side is the uh, side that faces the south, uh, the woods that's behind the site. And then these other elevations are along the uh, northwest, northeast and northwest. And the lowest one is the primary elevation. You can see it says library, and that is the a brown uh, siding that they talked about. <coughs> Parking for the new building is uh, requ requires 32, square, uh, 32 spaces. They are providing 50, which two of those being ADA spaces. Again, we, this currently shows two access points on the Heartland Drive. The city is requiring the Southern Drive here, as you can see, <coughs> to be eliminated with the primary reasons being it's it's within a curve and will have visibility safety concerns and the proposed drive lacks adequate spacing distance between the intersection and other driveways. The landscaping plan, which we'll see here in a second, appears to meet the city code requirement for this type of project, being a triangle shaped lots with streets adjoining the northeast and northwest sides. The lots of mobile home park on its south side. The plan show the library intends to re retain much of the existing tree line undergrowth between the new building and the park. Roughly 65 feet of, vacation of vegetation will be retained, which provides more than adequate buffer. The library expands its building here later. The topic will have to be revisited. <coughs> this is the landscape plan. Uh, this is only the uh, overstory plan, the tree plan. Uh, the understory plan, which is uh, the bushes and so forth, are actually divided into three pieces. So I just provide the over uh, the overstory plan, which it shows the tree cover that they're planning on. <coughs> uh, water, sanitary, and sewer and electrical services surround the property and adequate to serve the project. However, IPL, the Independence Power Line, indicates it has no means to provide electrical service here currently due to the lack of transformer stock. Shipment for this shipment time for the new inventory is unknown. Uh, the proposed addition is a step towards implementing a strategy of independence for all, which is to achieve livability, choice, access, health, and safety through quality built environment. And the site, this site, along with other properties in the area designated for mixed use by the plan, should feature a, a variety of townhomes, multifamily drillings, which is across the street, and uh, local commercial and personal health activities, including install institutional uses like a library. <clears throat> okay, here we're on the, uh, I guess it would be the northwest corner of the intersection of Little Blue Parkway and, uh, <clears throat> boy, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the road here, uh, <laughs> whatever it is. Heartland. Heartland Park, yeah, I'm sorry. We're looking directly at diagonally across this intersection. That is the land area where the uh, the library is going. Okay, here we're actually standing on a little blue parkway looking down into the site. The parkway is about 10 to 12 feet higher than the library's property at this point. <coughs> here we're looking south down Heartland Drive or Heartland Avenue. And uh, the properties, uh, the library's property is on the right. And further down to the left is the apartment complex. Here we're on Heartland Drive, looking to the southwest. Uh, off the distance there where the uh, red tree is, is what the height of where the highway is, a little blue parkway. Here's another site that shows the level area where the library building will be approximately. And another shot, again, that shows the tree line in the background, which is the buffer the, between the library and the mobile home park to the south. <coughs> this is the apartment complex that was just completed less than a year ago across from the site. And this is the church that is southeast of the site. And this is part of the mobile home park that's directly south of the site. Here we're looking west up Heartland Drive at the church uh, complex in the dis distance. And here we're looking uh, 
southwest down Little Blue Parkway. And uh, this is the campus across the Little Blue Parkway from the site. The driveways line up with the uh, Heartland. Staff does recommend approval of this preliminary development plan request with the following conditions. A new sideway ne a sidewalk needs to be added to the end of the property par slash parcel line, which is Valley View Road. <coughs> the sidewalk needs to tie into the existing sidewalk along the Little Blue Parkway, move it closer to the public right-of-way line. Independent Power Light has no way to provide service. Currently, due to the lack of uh, transformer stock, shipment time for this inventory is indefinite. Then remove the south southern driveway entrance into the site on, on the south elevation to provide a full window or something to break up the, the blank wall expanse. Six is all roof mounted equipment must be screened by a parapet equal to the height of the, of the parapet. On the final landscaping plans, include a table listing the required plantings along with the planting shown on the plan. The trash enclosure must be designed and construction constructed per city code 1450308 and relocated to the rear side as much as possible. And, the <clears throat> and then this preliminary development plan has not been reviewed for final engineering design compliance. All development engineering must be designed in accordance with city of independence standards and specifications prior to the approval of the final development plan. Thank you. Um, it, any questions of staff before we bring the applicant up? Matt, sure, I have a few questions here. Hey, staff, on the uh, sidewalks, are we continuing sidewalks all the way down Heartland on the whole property? Well, this is this would be they'd be responsible for all the sidewalks along their property. Yes. Well, but I'm so. I mean, I don't see it on the drawing. I just want to make sure sidewalk is going all the way down Heartland. You talked about extending it up to uh, Little Blue. I just want to make sure it's going down Heartland. Yes, it's going. It's really hard to tell, or you can't really see well on this site plan. But okay, on the, your other plan, it, it's not shown either. But that was our requirement. That was one of the conditions. Okay, so it is going all the way down Heartland. Okay, now, are they? Well, the second entrance. I can see the reason for it. I mean, I think it's going to be for like trash trucks and stuff to get in and out. I mean, I don't know. Have you talked to them about that before they brought them up? Or I mean, I think when we met with them several months ago, that was an issue that was discussed at the time. From what I remember, is we were not uh, in favor, I guess, you could, of that issue at that time. And then later, when they actually turned in an application, we reviewed it further and came up with the reasons why it should not be there. Yeah, your reasons for the safety concerns that you say turn out there. I mean, I'd, I'd see why they want ones for the trash trucks and trucks to get in and out in the circle radius there because it doesn't look like they have much room. I don't know where they bring trucks. I know some of them <coughs> bring in trucks, so I didn't know. I just, um, okay. Um, that's it right now. Thank you. Oh, okay, I, I was told that we may have lost the live feed for oh. this meeting, but we are recording the audio. Okay. So everybody make sure your mic is on when you're talking and your mic is off when you're not talking <laughs> intentionally. Will the applicant please come forward and state your name and your address, please. My name is Brad McKenzie with SAP Design Architects, uh, 1100 Main Street, Kansas City, Missouri, um, representing Mid-Continent Public Library today. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody this was uh, thankfully um, possible by passing Prop L back in 2017 and part of that was promised to get a library in East Independence. Um, we looked at a lot of different properties um, with Mid-Continent Public Library. This one turned out to be uh, the best possible one we could, we could obtain so we started proceeding with this. Um, we had some conversations with staff early on to make sure it was going to be feasible. They said that it would, so we proceeded with the design. Um, the exceptions that um, staff have noted, um, we are already in the process of taking care of those. Um, and to answer one of the questions, um, 
The second drive is something the library really likes because they're open seven days a week. And when they have to go in and maintain the drive and the parking lot, they like to shut down one drive and utilize the second drive. Mm -hmm. So they were really adamant that we try to get that through planning commission, but we have been told traffic doesn't like it. So it is what it is, but that's the purpose for, for that drive. Um, they like to do that at all of their libraries. Um, the transformer is another big issue. Um, it's a crazy time right now. We've not experienced this before. Uh, we're working with JE Dunn Construction. Um, right now, uh, they are in the process of trying to track down a transformer. Obviously, we would not start construction if we don't have that because um, they'll need power for, um, for doing the construction. We actually um, talked a little bit already with um, IPL and they said that there isn't even power close for us to use for construction. So we've got to get that squared away before, before we start. Um, we think we have some ideas on that. Um, one of the things too that we wanted to talk about was that trash enclosure. Um, we are planning to move that a little bit further back um, down the, the drive lane. We have some additional drawings. If you guys want to see any of that, some progress we've made since um, this. It's on the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, so these images are to talk about the roof screening. Um, so with this building sitting down from Little Blue, screening the rooftop equipment was very important to us, um, regardless of zoning requirements. So you can see the bottom right is as you're approaching Little Blue from, I guess, kind of the southwest. Um, and that tall wall on the front is in large part designed to screen um, all of the rooftop equipment from Little Blue. Um, unfortunately, in, in the original submittal for the, for the PDP, we had some rooftop equipment shown further back on the roof that has since been coordinated with our engineers and moved, so it's all immediately behind. And I think we have, yeah, there's a roof plan. So you can see down at the lower right of that is the roof hatch to get to the roof, and then it takes you up to where all the equipment is tucked in behind that wall. Um, then the view on the lower left is just from a little bit further down, little blue. Uh, the view in the top right is actually from Heartland as you're coming down from little blue, again showing. We have the entrance popped up so that it hides the rooftop as well. And then the one in the top left is from the entrance down on Heartland. So we worked really hard to make sure that the equipment can't be seen from anywhere except for from the trees. So um, this is information we haven't talked further with with staff um, to make sure that that is suitable, that we don't also need to screen it from the trees. But just want to let you know that we are working to address those issues already. I think those are the only, oh. This is the facade that staff had recommended. We um, put something on to break up um, the expanse of brick and you can see the trash enclosure in the bottom left where it's located now, uh, which staff um, didn't like. We had it located there originally just so that it was easier to get to for the trash truck, um, but we have located them further down. I don't, I don't have a mouse, but if you go down the drive, um, like you're gonna go into the to the drive up window. We put trash enclosures down there before trash trucks go down and then back out. Um, so to accommodate that, we'll just move the trash enclosure down a little bit further. Um, our civil engineer is here as well and he has a plan that kind of shows that if, if anybody would like to see it. Um, but we'll of course as well work with staff if we need to to figure out what we want to do to this facade to break it up. We'd rather not put a faux window but if that expanse of bricks not acceptable. We'll come up with with something to do on there. So, um, any questions for me? Would you consider like some type of relief art or something on there that would just add interest to the building? Yeah, I mean, we we would want to come up with something that makes sense rather than just kind of tacking something on. Um, one of the things we looked at is between the drive up window and you can kind of see that dark box that's the employee entrance door and it's kind of recessed is we could add another window there that functions well if something more is required further down the corner yeah we would come up with maybe a different color brick or something in it if if that's going to be a requirement 
we just, like I said, we, we want to think about what it needs to be so that it doesn't just look like something we've tacked onto the building. Yeah. And this is the side of the building that's not highly visible. You can see it from Heartland if you're coming more from the south, but most people coming into the library won't see it. But they will not see it? Is that what you said? Okay. Correct. Unless they go to the drive up, obviously. Um, so you're, you're suggesting, and, and the plans are hard to read on the screen, but you're suggesting the trash enclosure essentially moves to the southwest and sort of in line with that drive. So Correct. They'll go down, they'll pick up, and they'll back up. Have you had any conversations with the trash company to see what their schedule is going to be? My, my only real concern is if it's coming in during normal business hours, you're going to block the ability to get to the drive through and then backing up a trash truck into back up into traffic and people that are coming and going could be tenuous um, we I don't know Terry we, we have not at this point um, one of the things that we have worked this is the 34th branch we've done for Midcontinent Public Libraries that's one of the things we've always coordinated as well as their deliveries because Midcontinent's deliveries are in the same area so it's something that we will coordinate with the trash company it's an operational thing for Midcontinent as well so it's important um, as far as the, um, the South Drive, I, I also understand why the South Drive was, was good from the standpoint of the trash um, deliveries. Is it the city staff position that they just do not want a trash enclosure visible at all? Well, the city code says, uh, from, what I, from what I remember, that, that the dumpster should be in an inconspicuous place and not open to the the, the street, so the, the viewed from the, uh, the gate shouldn't be viewed from the uh, public streets. Okay. So we uh, try to, and we know that's not always possible, but we try to alter them, shift them around in some fashion, or put them further back in the site as possible. Understood. Um, I, I completely understand where you're coming from on the transformer, probably switch gear and other, other long lead items. Yeah. Um, this is impacting your ability to move the project forward. Yes, right now. at this point. Um, we, our hope is to go ahead and apply for a building permit as soon as we get um, city council approval for the final development plan. So we're working diligently right now to line up a transformer. Okay. Um, and then as far as the roof mounted equipment, I appreciate hiding it behind the facade. Is it the city staff position that all four sides needs to be? concealed or is it just the primary view? Well, uh, I, I think that it says all four sides, but uh, I'll have to look at their design. I have not seen it before tonight, so it's, you know, it sounds like a possibly a workable deal. Okay. Um, I believe that's all I've had. Um, I've enjoyed watching your projects go up. They're nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of the applicant? you answered most of the recommendations which obviously you're comfortable with because you're working on them well, I did have one question more yeah. question for staff uh, I mean it may be a typo on number six on the report all of roof mounted equipment must be screened by a parapet equal to the height of the parapet should that be equipment that's right is that My correct mistake. yes you're okay. correct Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Is there anyone here who would like to speak for this project? Is there anyone here who would like to speak against this project? Hearing none, this portion of the public portion of this case is closed. Commissioners, any more discussion, question of staff, comments? Madam, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, I, my biggest part, a uh, couple things here is going to be the the entrance. I mean, you say safety, so there was a traffic study done then? Well, not a study. Our, our engineer, traffic engineer, did review the plans. I think he went out to the site and looked around, and that was his, his opinion. They, they said site view because of the, I mean, they're just saying site view on the exit of it, correct? What was that again? I'm sorry. Site, the site view exiting the property, that's the only reason why they the safety ex issue 
Patrick? I think the primary reason was that it doesn't meet the distance between, you have too many intersections too close to each other that have full access. If they moved it down farther? But I mean, I don't know how much more room I, they have. I think it's still the same situation. Same situation? Yes. Okay, I mean, they're, they're liking to have it, so that's why I didn't know what the deal yep. was there. Okay. Uh, then on the, the photo, like what we're seeing right there, um, my opinion, I don't see anything wrong with it. You're, you're saying that it needs to have something else added there? Is that staff's opinion? Yeah, th that's something that we can work out with the applicant. I mean, it is possible they could add a canopy over the, the person entrance there, the one that's cut out in the, as you can see, or something along those lines. Well, do we then, okay, but do we need reword number five or do we just need to take number five out? Because uh, we're saying it's got to have a window and now we're saying maybe a canopy and something, that's what I'm saying. Do we just need to take that out? Well, we said provide a take window or something here, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's okay. Clear. It's pretty vague, yeah. yeah. Vague give give some latitude. Like give some latitude. Okay, so I'll make sure. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? No okay. Uh, Madam Chair, in the uh, matter of case 22-810-02, uh, preliminary development plan for 4505 South Little Blue Parkway. Uh, I move for approval with conditions, uh, with uh, condition six corrected, such that the last word is equipment. I second. Thank you. We're ready for a vote. <clears throat> Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner H. Wiley? Yes. Commissioner L. Wiley? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, case number 22-810-02, preliminary development plan at approximately 4505 Little Blue Parkway has been approved. Thank you very much and thank you for your investment in the city. I'm a tiny bit um, competitive, so I'm happy anytime our city gets something really cool. So thank you very much and hope to goodness that that dang transformer gets here. <laughs> thank you. Case 22-175-02, UDO amendment number 54 for short-term rentals. We are ready, staff. All right, I think the moment you're all been waiting for. <laughs> Give a second here. All right, short-term rental amendment. Um, So first, to kind of just talk a little bit about the history of kind of how we got here. Um, I realize that there's actually a lot of cities, smaller cities mostly around our area that actually don't have a um, short-term rental program or some kind of licensing program for this. So in 2017, uh, staff uh, began looking at the short-term rental um, situation here in the city. Um, and you kind of see the dates there, March 2018. Uh, there was a council study session on, on the topic. Uh, in May of 2018, uh, staff met with Hotel and Motel Alliance to talk about um, you know, how this would affect them. Uh, we also met with uh, bed and breakfast operators as well uh, in the area. And in 2000, November of 2018, uh, the original short-term rental uh, ordinance had passed. In late 2019, we did make an amendment to that. Um, it's kind of an evolving code, you know, as we see some new different types of websites and how people are renting their property. And so uh, there was an amendment made in 2019 that basically, that's the part that added uh, no more than five owners uh, to the short-term rental or that can have a short-term rental. We also added the uh, one per structure per block face, so that kind of limited uh, where they could be at that time. And then we did include uh, with that code amendment that the rental ready inspection happen yearly, annually. Uh, so these permits are annual permits that have to be renewed. So with that, we'll kind of just jump in. Um, the gist of it is, so everything that's currently in the code 
is still in there. What we did, however, is we pulled away. So bed and breakfasts as well as short-term rentals were all part of one section, and we felt it necessary to separate those out. And so we created a new section, which we'll go through. Um, and so just I'm only going to cover the topics that we changed, we added, uh, but keep in mind, everything that was currently still in the code is still in there. It is in a new section, however. And so uh, the first thing I'll cover is 14.205. Uh, this particular section, um, we did want to change some of the definitions and revise some of those. So we did change the, the short-term, and I use STR as short-term rental, and just to save space on my slides. Uh, but the definition we did create for duplex units, um, and we wanted to clarify what actually is a short-term rental and what can be used for a short-term rental. And so, for example, uh, motor homes, um, tents, recreational vehicles, portable buildings are not considered dwellings uh, for short-term rentals. And then we did add a definition for a single-family dwelling, uh, just to be consistent with our definitions and um, define that the short-term rental has limited to one to 30 day stays and not considered hotels, motels, or bed and breakfast. Uh, we did also provide a definition for a short-term rental operator who is basically any person who is the owner of a dwelling who offers or provides their unit up for a short-term rental use. <clears throat> we made modifications to section 14420 and this was the original short-term rental code section. This is the part that had the bed and breakfast and the short-term rentals combined. And so we basically pulled out bed and breakfast and then created the next section, which we'll see and focus in mostly on tonight as the short-term rental. Excuse me. So this is a new section, 14.424. And these are... Again, everything that was in the previous section is now in this section plus these things. And so what we wanted to include is kind of a statement of purpose. Uh, we didn't really have that in there. Uh, we get a lot of questions sometimes as to why, we're, why we require permit for this type of thing. Um, and really, it, I'm just kind of summarize the definition, but essentially we're trying to create a balance between economic opportunities for those who want to have short-term rentals while you know keeping those houses here and locally owned and that type of thing, but also protecting the owners, the guests, and the neighborhoods and the communities that they're in uh, by putting these regulations together. And so <clears throat> what we're allowing, um, basically these, were, so we define this, in a, define this in a way where single family and duplex dwellings um, are allowed to be short-term rentals, not detached accessory buildings and not multifamily housing. So we did define that um, in this section uh, before it wasn't very clear what could or couldn't be. <coughs> uh, we did want to make sure that we were capturing the transient guest tax. Uh, that was not um, in the previous code sections as well. And um, we have to have, at least when the applicant does come forward, they, they need to provide either the agreement with the platform that they're using. It could be VRBO or Airbnb. Um, if they don't already have a platform to collect the transient guest tax, then we'll have to have a agreement with that particular applicant to do so. And we did add, and this is in addition to the block face, um, that the short-term rentals can be no closer than 500 feet from an, another uh, short-term rental property line. Um, and so this would kind of prevent them being clustered. And, um, you know, we had discussions about LLCs and, you know, the limitation, the five, and how you can kind of get around that. Um, we didn't want a situation where we can't necessarily limit somebody from creating another LLC, but we can uh, do our best to make sure that they're not clustered in a bunch of areas. So you don't have some you know company that comes in and buys a whole bunch of houses in a neighborhood or a particular street or block face that can meet the block face requirement but not necessarily now with the fi 500 foot separation we however did not include the separation in the arts district <coughs> and we did not create a density limitation in commercial districts um, and this really 
uh, has more to do with we've had several applicants for short-term rentals in the downtown area and then in commercial areas we do allow residential like on the second floor for example so they don't necessarily fit the definitions for residential and or duplex dwellings and so that is why we have excluded them from those specifications we do now require a responsible agent to be des designated and require that they have the ability to be within one hour from independence <clears throat> that responsible agent uh, we have put in here to be available 24 hours a day seven days a week and in the event of a um, complaint or a call they must be able to respond within an hour doesn't mean they have to solve whatever the issue is within the hour but they need to respond to us uh, within the hour any changes to that particular responsible agent must be submitted to the city in within five days so if there's a different uh, property management company or somebody that they want to designate we need to be aware of that we did include language in here that prohibits the use of renting a short-term rental for the purposes of weddings banquets charitable uh, funding and parties um, if you and I didn't include that in this particular uh, note but we do still allow, you know, for family gatherings if somebody's renting that. So it's not necessarily that people can't, you know, obviously be together. Uh, but the whole purpose of this is to make sure that somebody's not renting this out to um, have a party with more people than uh, are allowed in the house. And of course, then we added the specification that no, rent, nobody, not more than one booking can book at a short-term rental at the same time. Just wanted to make sure that was in there. <coughs> and of course, clarify that the short-term rental operator, um, even if it's not the owner, uh, can't live in the unit while the unit's being rented. And this is kind of already in there, but we also made sure that the prohibiting of food, snacks, and meals uh, to guests are, are not allowed in the short-term rental. And we did have the discussion about liability insurance. Um, Although I'm sure some of the platforms may offer certain types of insurances, um, we are now requiring that the applicant have uh, appropriate liability insurance up to a million dollars uh, for the purpose of renting the short-term rental. And um, we also noted that the short-term rental is not transferable and it can't uh, move from one order to, to the next. Um, if it's a new property owner, then they need to come back for another short-term rental permit. We are requiring <coughs> the use of the what we're calling a good neighbor guideline and um, that the particular applicant must place this in a um, easy to find location for the um, tenants that, that would visit. Um, it will include things such as the maximum occupancy of the, of the house, the ex evacuation plan, uh, where the allowed parking is, how to take care of your trash service. Um, it notifies them of the noise plan, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, and um, who the responsible agent is to contact, and the license number of the city permit that they have uh, posted. Uh, we are going to require the use in this particular code of uh, noise monitoring devices. We did some pretty good research into that. They're not very expensive, and I think there's a lot of benefits to that, and I think we've seen recently a lot of the applicants are finding that out themselves also. Um, so we felt it was appropriate almost as if we see cameras in, in most of these places. and it, They're not very expensive anymore, not like they used to be and um, requiring them to also post their quiet hours and penalties for violations that um, if they break the city noise ordinances. Um, require parking on approved driveways on a hard surface. Um, we do, there, there can be some variations of that if you look at the language that we've provided in your package, um, primarily asphalt concrete, but there could also be a possibility if you have pavers that are permanently installed and um, in good condition that can handle that type of loading. But, um, but that's now cod codified in this amendment to, so we don't have that argument sometimes. <coughs> so 
So again, continuing, um, we did create a new application process or a new application, and that's in your packet. This application does, uh, we, we kind of went through a lot of research to figure out what's the best way to um, display this, and we, we actually had Miranda go through and create some of these things, so it's not like you have to have AutoCAD or anything to create a floor plan. Um, and we can certainly help an applicant do so if they need to, but we wanted to make sure that in their application that they provide to us, um, provides the, shows the number of rooms, the occupancy, um, the um, list of platforms that they're gonna use, and the floor plan with the exits, the windows, the bathrooms, kitchens, smoke detectors, fire extinguishers, carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide detectors, the evacuation plan and their parking. So that's all going to be included in the new application that um, is in your packet. Um, a testation form for the applicant to, to sign, uh, making sure that they acknowledge that there's no liens on the property or outstanding taxes on the property and that they are going to be complying or currently complying with the property maintenance code. Um, and that they will make sure that they have working smoke detectors and, and fire extinguishers and making sure that they don't expire. Um, <coughs> and the other thing too is, you know, we, we haven't necessarily had this issue, but there's a possibility that if you're in an HOA and um, maybe not some of the older ones, but possibly some of the newer ones, that if there's a restriction on that, that the city's made aware that there's a restriction or covenants or recorded covenants that doesn't allow you to do a short-term rental. And so, um, and then of course, the non-discrimination clause, as well as making sure that they are going to intend to post the good neighbor guidelines and, and provide trash, continue to provide trash service and continue to use the noise monitoring devices um, as they have stated they say, that as they have stated they would. Thank you. Can we take a three minute Yes. That's just for a minute. I just want, we want to go check on Virginia real quick. So we're going to take a recess for three minutes, 707. residential short-term rentals uh, for that to be essentially a staff approval application process in commercial districts uh, by the director provided that they are meeting all of the terms of this particular code. Um, one of the reasons for that is it is a commercial district and it was felt that it would be more to expedite those uh, in the commercial district. Um, but that is something that we are including in this particular amendment. Um, if, for example, it does not get approved by the director, we did put in here an appeals process that would come to the Planning Commission. Um, and so that is a section that we've included. Uh, we did provide clarification in here for violations, penalties, and enforcement. I know that's come up several times as to what happens if somebody's not complying. Um, they are yearly licenses and you know they, they can be taken away, uh, but we wanted to clarify their revocation process. And so we really, we outlined it essentially in this uh, code amendment. Essentially, if they have been cited for two or more offenses in a three month period, that would kick in a revocation process. Um, if the applicant, or if we find out that the applicant has uh, misrepresented something, or uh, if we feel like there's fraud or s false information in their application packet, uh, that would kick that in as well. 
um, and any violations that would endanger the public or the safety or welfare welfare of um, the community or anybody around there that would also kick that in and of course failure to pay your taxes <laughs> and uh, property taxes and or sales taxes <coughs> uh, basically this would require a public hearing for the re revocation and planning commission we did put in here outlines for this group to consider in that event and of course those include the nature of the seriousness of the violation uh, impacts on the neighboring community as well as corrective action that may or may not have been taken by the uh, responsible agent, um, any prior violations at this particular site, and the likelihood of reoccurrence. Um, and lastly, uh, the entirety of that particular circumstance and um, the time that the applicant has had their license. All right, Rick, we're gonna, that's gonna come to us in These, the event the public hearings for for yes. revocation they're yes. going to come to us yes yep yes it, it would and i just kind of threw this one here uh, business license application because i think some people may not be aware but this does kick in all the departments uh, there are physical inspections that happen with it they are reviewed by all the um, departments, fire, police, um, utilities, et cetera, and they do go out and they conduct their inspections prior to giving any business a business license, so it's not just short-term rentals. And, and of course, again, they are annual, um, and they do require the rental-ready inspection every year as well. And with that, do we have any questions? Commissioners, any questions? Rick, who's going to enforce the penalties and that? Is that going to be codes? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so essentially we would have to be either notified or made aware that there's an issue. We would go out, that would basically be a business license inspection, and we would, if necessary, uh, kick in that revocation process. So codes would be basically. Yeah, it, it could also just be a code issue. Okay. Um, but um, yes, it would be. I mean, is that s stated in here that codes would take over enforcement? Um, we didn't put here specifically that it would be community development, but it would just be the business licensing because that's where it's approved through business licensing. So it would be a business licensing uh, inspection. Okay. Well, I mean, that. how? I mean, my aspect is okay. Good, they got cited, they got all this, but how are we gonna know they stopped doing it? Oh, if, if we do have a complaint and, and you know, we'll, we'll typically give them a period of time and then there's a hearing to make sure that the applicant either is or isn't, it, it, it depends on what it could be, maybe it's, it's, it's like tall grass, right. um, then we would have it, we have a hearing with them, it doesn't actually go to court. Um, if they don't resolve that in the appropriate amount of time, they could go to court or it could kick in the revocation process. It could be both. So it could be both. Yes. Okay. okay. I was going to say, I know how it works with, like, the the in above Ophelia's. Like, we're inspected annually, and then we'd have, like, 30 days to, like, if we miss something or, right? Yes. Is that, so it's yeah. typically. Yeah, typically you, you'll get, typically it's, like, 30 days. Um, it's possible as if, let's say, for example, there is an issue and you're working on it. Uh, you know, right now we do have some of those situations where people are trying to get contract contractors to fix yeah. things. Uh, maybe there's material shortages or time delays, that type of thing. So we can give extensions on that, provided we know that they are in the process of making those improvements or fixing whatever that violation is. Okay. If we don't hear anything and if they were just completely ignored, then then that goes to court or in this situation, it could go to court and it could come before this group for revoking. Okay, because I will say they do come back, like on that 30 days, they do come back to see if we did it, whatever it was. Well, one other so. thing, Rick, on the good neighbor guide, is that something they fill out and hand to each neighbor around the area, is that what it does? So it just has to be posted. Um, this is basically kind of like the rules, I guess, if you would say they we're, we're requiring it to be posted very similar, I guess, if you were to look at it like a liquor license or 
Um, a liquor license, license has to have their license. Oh, so it's just posted at the place. Basically, they Correct. have to send it to each. Yeah, neighbor. they have to submit that to us with an application, right. and, and that's required to get the business license, but it will also be required to be posted at the site. You, it's not a good I mean, I would think it would be a good idea to go ahead and send it to each neighbor around so they have all the information. Is they can good? too, yes. Yeah, I they, mean, they I mean could we're not that. reckoning for it. You're saying not to do that, but can we have that maybe added? I mean, I don't know if that's something good or not. Um, we did not put that in there um, as far as, like, enforcing them to hand it out to all their people around there. Well, I mean, I would think that would be a good idea that way. The neighbor would know exactly that's what this is being because some neighbors do not know what's happening until all of a sudden it happens and all of a sudden we have all these cars. And Because I don't know, are they posting signs out in front of them that they're doing this like a like the zoning no you mean like is it like a sign that this is a short-term rental or something like well that? i mean are, when they come up here before us i know they put yes signs up. yes, okay. yes for still uh, public hearings so yes. still yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all the public hearings are notified yes okay. there is a sign in front of there okay when well, they come I, just, before us. I mean they're supposed to send the letters out. i mean you guys send the letters out that's why i didn't know yep. but okay i just want to yep. make sure now, are we going back on ones that have already been approved, or this is going forward? So this will be going forward. Okay, so right now, short-term rentals already have to do yearly inspections? Yes. Okay, I just want to make yes. sure. So the new codes, when they come up, they'll be notified of all the new stuff? Yes. Okay. Yep. On that, to clarify, so ones that are currently within their first year prior to renewal, or however many years ahead of time prior to the next renewal, they do not have to adhere at all, or they will have to adhere to this when, when they, they renew? When they come up for their renewal is when we'll make them provide. So they're only grandfathered for up to a year, depending on timing. Yeah, essentially, yes. Yeah. For up to when this takes an effect? Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple questions. Yeah, go ahead. And this is a small item, but food and meals prohibited. I've stayed my share of Airbnbs. There's always seasoning, salt, pepper, basic stuff like that. That's not a problem. No, um, not I that enjoy type cooking of thing. When I'm, when I'm it's traveling. just sometimes we've, for in, in, in this one, I probably shouldn't say, it's not, it's, it's hard to police that sometimes. You know, it's hard for us to know if there's a cereal box or something in a cabinet somewhere. Uh, but the intent there is to make sure it's not being treated as a food service. So that's why we, sure. we have that in there. And then the only other um, um, thought I had was on under prohibited uses. It states very clearly in your report, but prohibited uses at the end of the Good Neighbor Guide, uh, I think we should go ahead and specifically add parties okay. explicitly. Okay. I agree. To that one, I was wondering, because you said we don't mean family gatherings, but there is a an amount of people at any event that would be too many for a neighborhood or for a neighbor. So I would like to see some kind of max number based on square footage or something. So we do have a maximum number currently. That's the part that's kind of already existing on the number of people that can be at the short term rental and it's 10. Okay. And so it's two, basically it's two adults per bedroom. Um, up to four bedrooms, and so we allow like for two kids, so technically eight and then ten max. So ten is the maximum number. Is that somewhere? Yes, that that's in the that's that's actually in Did the it? current code. Okay. We, like I said, we pulled that out and put it in this section, uh, but all that stuff remains in there. These are all the new, uh, new amendments, basically. I have about three questions. Go ahead. Um, They're good. First one was I wanted to say thank you because I've often thought it very odd that bed and breakfasts were compared to short-term rentals when the way it's occupied and ran yes. is completely different. So I'm glad that you're providing some separation there. Um, on number E, um, On one, on one place there, it lists some of the things, back to your question, of what's not allowed, but on the good neighbor policy, those wordings are not the same, and I think they should mirror each other. Okay. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. Right. I um, I have 
little notes all over, so give me one second here. Oh, the um, task that we may have to do, which would be revocation that comes before us, is that ever sped up or change due to any kind of involvement over a police matter at these locations? I mean, with, with this, it would just have to be on the next available meeting. Uh, so as far as like speeding it up, you mean like having a special... If there is a true security reason that this short-term rental should cease. So let's say, for example, somebody's doing something that's just completely bad. Um, more than likely, it would be shut down. Um, and that and would be through the business happen? licensing happening. That would be through the business licensing. Okay. Um, and then what would happen is that we would go through the process. It would almost be similar to giving somebody like a stop work order if they're if they're not in compliance, and if they haven't um, attempted to be in compliance. And then that that's where it would then follow that process of being revoked. Uh, understand there would be a time period there to get it on the agenda and get it to this commission to consider. But uh, yeah, if it's something egregious like that, then more than likely they're going to be, they're not going to be able to operate or we're going to have to shut it down like we would a business that's not doing something. And the way that that is written on here at 90 days, their third offense. So does that mean on day 91, their offenses start all over? You know, we had to put in kind of a timeline that we thought would be reasonable. Um, one of the things, and that's kind of where we put in that consideration for how long the person's had an applic or had a permit or a license. Um, say, for example, somebody's had a license for five years and may have had um, no issues until they happen to rent to somebody, and for whatever reason, they've got three of these. So it's it's a question then of is it because the um, owner or the applicant is doing something inappropriate or do they just happen to you know lease this th or rent this thing out to somebody and they just happen to get a couple of bad apples and, and so that's part of what would have to be considered um, so it's not necessarily clear-cut in that sense but we did feel like we had to have some kind of um, specification to define what what, what does it mean to start a reg, you know, revoking their permit? And then I kind of brought this up last time, so I just went it on the record. Did a little research on Airbnbs in our city. Um, there is currently an RV parked on a driveway that is listed as an Airbnb in Independence. There's currently an apartment in a multi-unit family dwelling that is listed as an Airbnb. So. How are we going to work to better ensure that anybody operating as an Airbnb is playing by the rules? So that's a, <coughs> I mean, it's a very good question. Um, a lot of what we do, again, we're limited to, you know, entrapping people and trying to determine if they're operating illegally. Um, so a lot of what we do is we do rely on the public to notify us if something looks wrong, and that's when we go in and do our inspections. Um, sometimes, you know, that, that it's not just a question of short-term rentals, it's a question of other um, maybe illegal businesses running out of people's homes. Uh, we always run into that issue where we get calls that there's a bunch of people parked in front of a, a house, and sometimes we will go and catch it, but in many cases, it's after hours, and we're not there to see it. And it's kind of like a police officer, you gotta see it and in order to address it. And so, um, but really, short of recontinuing to figure out the best way to track down people that are operating illegally, um, that is how we're currently looking at it, is we, we have to really rely on, you know, our own inspectors going around noticing things as well as the public notifying us. So if you see something, say something and who do, so depending on what yeah. department should respond, 
it's who a public yeah, citizen I mean, should again, report to. Exactly, and, and they can do that, obviously, to community development. They can also do it to a police department, and if it does... If it goes to the police department and they know it happens to be a short-term rental, they'll, they'll notify us as well. There is also the city application, the website that you can use to report yes. issues. Yes, there is. Is there enough detail? And so I know there's a lot of options mm -hmm. you can pick from when you're trying to report an issue in your neighborhood. Is there enough detail in there to where that application will say this is a short-term rental you issue. You know, it probably doesn't say specifically short-term rental. It's been a while since I've actually looked at the portal for that, mm -hmm. um, but that's a very good question. We can take a look and see if there is a way to provide an option to report specifically that, a short-term rental. Um, I am also grateful that you took the time to address so many of the issues that I know that have come up over the past what, two, three years, whatever it's been. And I feel like you've done an incredible job of addressing all of them. And I was just thinking about reminding myself that even the ones like the 90 day one, the nice part about it is everybody has to be, for the most part, if they're smart, they're with VRBO or Airbnb. So there is a catch because people, if they have a bad experience, do report it and they do shut you down. So at least there is kind of a, a multi-layered thing. So I feel a little better about that. Um, I do think like, I, I don't know whether this really comes out under our purview or not, but it would be nice to have like some PSAs go out in a campaign form or somehow that where people could report these because it is kind of off the radar unless you are attuned to short-term rentals. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of shared with you an idea that I had that is kind of crazy, but how can we incentivize some of these people who don't have their business license, you know, and, and maybe it is on the city's website, we list those legitimate Airbnbs that have perfect track rec records and deserve that free advertising, you know, you get to be on the listed on the city website. I mean, I think as a person, if it was linked to my Airbnb website that I am listed on the city as a safe place, I would feel good. I don't know. Yeah, I think from the, the PSA standpoint, if it's, you know, I thought I was thinking about this too, but I'm not sure what is appropriate for city staff to advocate for. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of the opposite of entrapment. It's more, you know, yeah, citi citizens do the right things, but if you put it in the utility newsletter or just social media or something along those lines, I don't know what the right answer is, and I'm, I'm curious what is well, appropriate or not. Yeah, what I was going to say, I, I do need to have a discussion with our PIO officer on what would, it, what would or wouldn't be appropriate. Um, it would seem to me that if we have... Uh, licensed businesses that we would be able to do something with those that are licensed. Um, but yes, that is a discussion that I would still need to have with our um, public information officer. It's hard, and I know we're not alone in this conversation. I mean, other cities are dealing with this. But I think that's one thing, that other thing. I just appreciate so much about you because you have evolved with it. I mean, as things have come up, you guys are attacking it quickly, as quickly as a city can. <laughs> Yeah, and one thing I didn't kind of end with is, keep in mind, this is going to be an evolving code, yeah. I think, um, and we've kind of had some discussions about this with new different types of websites coming out, um, homeroom, and how do we deal with some of these almost long-term rental situations, um, yeah. but it's not just, it's not just going to be this, it could be, you know, people renting out their backyards for parties or... Uh, some of the event amenities that somebody may have in their home, you know, it, it's going to have to evolve, I think, with the times and, and whatever um, digital platforms are out there. I mean, I think you can kind of see kind of where we started from and how, you know, where we're at today. Um, we don't necessarily want it so overbearing that um, it's it's even hard for staff to, to manage, but yeah. um, we just have to pivot, play that balancing act as far as you know what what's new out there what problems are we having and is there a way to address that in our codes and so I, I don't I, I see this having to probably be updated again in the future I think it's going to be somewhat of a fluid document as as the times change well, 
it's human nature, it seems like, to find the loopholes. So you're just mm -hmm. trying to be three steps ahead of everybody is tough. I did have one other question. Can you walk through, you, we had talked just very briefly before about moratorium on current applications. So we did submit a, a resolution to council to put a moratorium on short-term rentals while this process was going through. So um, I believe that's on the next meeting, council, council meeting. And so we, we hope that that does get. Um, but the expectation okay. would be that these new rules and regulations, this new code would get through Submitted well, yeah, and then and, and by next mind, year. Yes. Now keep in okay. mind we do have some already in the process, and so those wouldn't necessarily apply to that moratorium. Um, I assume the council could change that if they ch chose to do so, but um, that wasn't the intent. The intent was to prevent more future ones coming forward. And of course, if we do get an application, uh, you know, we'll just have to let the applicant know. Hey, look, it's you know. Your, your application is going to be put on hold um, until that gets resolved or until this issue gets approved. So hopefully it wouldn't be too long, but but yes, we, we're kind of working towards that. I think it's important. Just take a breath, take a beat. Um, I open this to the public, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay. Is there anyone here who would like to speak for this in a positive way for this amendment? Is there anyone here who would like to speak against? Come on up. State your name and your address. What's your name in a quarter of this? Thank you. My name is Lee. My last name is Phillips. I live at 1423 South Maywood Avenue, Independence, Missouri 64052. My statement is very short. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. I am pleased to see that some attention is being paid to the short-term rental regulations and for considering safety concerns for our neighborhoods. However, I am hopeful that this is not the final revision. There appear, in conversation and on paper, to be many unresolved issues regarding this topic. I'm hoping that you will not approve this specific as it stands. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward? All right, thank you. All right, um, hearing no other comments, the public portion of this case is closed. Um, commissioners, any more comments or discussions? I have a question. Um, so the number five, that you can own five. How can you talk to me about how? So I think uh, I don't know, Stuart, if you're familiar with how they initially came up with it. Um, I think one of the things that we do a lot of times is that we research other cities yes. and kind of determine okay. what um, we we do. Kind of want to know what others are doing and right. see if it makes sense. Um, I don't know if there was a specific uh, reasoning behind it, but I think it felt as if uh, five particular short-term rentals by an owner would be an appropriate amount to limit. Um, but again, as, as we kind of discussed before, that doesn't stop somebody from creating an LLC, which there becomes a different owner, essentially, and yeah. having another five and another five and another five. Um, there really just is no good way, at least from our research, to prevent that. Uh, and therefore, that's why we put in the 500 foot from another, so we don't see a cluster of uh, maybe some kind of out of town investors per purchasing you know, an entire cul de sac or something right. to rent out. And so that was the intent of trying to at least mitigate that to the best of our abilities. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, what the comment from the uh, from the people is, what, I mean, to me it sounds like a good plan. I mean, I don't see anything wrong. I mean, I don't know, there is a couple words that need to be fixed, but I mean, in my opinion, I don't see anything else that we can add to it at this time. I mean, yes, there's going to be things come up in the future, so 
I mean, I say this is a good plan to move forward with, in my opinion. Yeah. I think it's got some teeth that we haven't had in the past. And um, I, you know, I've been reading a lot about this too, and there's kind of an Airbnb bust going on right now. They're, they're less popular, they're being less used. And um, so sometimes I think these things could work themselves out in, the, in that way. Um, but I'm also concerned about some of the things coming up in our city in the next few years, which is why I'm, I, I, I mean, I think five is a good number, but I am nervous about out of town investors buying up property, you know, right before the World Cup or, and then leaving us high and dry. Um, but I guess the thing is, we, there's no way to figure that out, I, I mean. There's no way to predict every thing that can happen. Yeah. So I think we have to do the best that we can mm -hmm. as a, you know, from city staff and as a, as a, as a commission. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I've only been here for a couple of years, but it, it seems like we respond mm -hmm. as quickly as we can to things that come up and, and we'll pivot as we need to. So I appreciate that about, mm -hmm. about the city. So that's all yeah. I have to say. Ms. Phillips. I just wanted to thank you because you spoke eloquently at a council meeting not too long ago, and it really spurred me to research this a lot. Um, and it helped me form an opinion about future short-term rentals. So um, words matter, your feelings matter, but mostly just coming and speaking really does matter. Agreed. It, it does matter very much to hear the citizen's voice because you're experiencing it, you know, firsthand. And, and so we do appreciate that very much. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, you can't respond to absolutely everything, but I feel like the, the things that you did change, it may not be easy to see, but I think you did address a lot of the safety issues and that it's kind of a, I don't know, a domino kind of a thing because you've got, you have some safeguards in place. Like I said, with the Airbnb, you do have the police in place. You do have, we have some layers to kind of prevent that. And I like that the way you've worded some of the things, I think it's kind of like that catch that yes, can go away at some point, but <laughs> to your point, it's, it's evolving and this is not like a end to end. So that's, that's good. Heck, I did just think of another question I wrote down. I don't know where it was, but it talked about minimum level of insurance. Yes. What determines minimum? How much is not enough? So we basically put in a million. Typically, a lot of I, our- I saw the word minimum. I didn't see a million. <laughs> it's in the code. Yeah, okay. a, a minimum of, of a million of liability coverage. Madam Chair? Yes. I make a motion that we approve case 22175-02 to amend UDO number 54 short-term rental amendments. I second. Well, there's there's not conditions, but did we, we did make a recommendation that the Good Neighbor Guide be, have the language aligned more specifically with the language in the code. There was, there was a e. few things that were yeah, maybe e. just not quite as consistent, like the word parties and some of those other things. Just that that could be an ongoing, right. a working perpetual working. draft as need be, but whatever the, and maybe it's the, maybe it needs to be reworded that is the current draft, current version of the good, you know, of the good neighbor guide is, is what is posted. I don't know, I'll, I'll do that. So I would basically have it as making sure the good neighbor guide meets the current code as well as adding no parties to it. Correct. Exactly. I think is that yeah, fair? Correct. Yeah. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. Did I not just not hear you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I started talking over you. <laughs> All right, we're ready for a vote. <coughs> <coughs> Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner H. Wiley? Yes. Commissioner L. Wiley? Yes. Chair McLean? 
Yes. Case number 22-175-02, UDO amendment number 54 for short-term rentals has been approved and will now go to council. Thank you very much. Um, round table, next meeting is November 15th. And Billy tried, Commissioner Preston tried to come tonight, but it didn't work out, so maybe next time, November 15th. Yeah, just a reminder, we only have one meeting in November and one in December. Yeah. I have a question about something. Is this a good time to bring it up? It's round table. Okay. Um, there is an absolutely gigantic campaign sign on 23rd and Nolan Road. It, has, it, it, it's, it can't be up to code, right? I mean, is also, it's on... Um, yes, which I don't think, any, I mean, do they have to get permission from whoever owns that space? I'm just, I just would love to know that. This is on the northwest corner of that intersection. Yeah. Yes. Uh, where the gas station and the tire place used to be. Yeah. Right, now they're gonna make a dental office, supposedly. Yeah. That's right. Um, I don't know, now that it's too big, I can tell you that. It's but, way too um, big. We'll to my knowledge, I was told yeah, that check political signs could only be four by eight and they gotta be in the ground or something to hold them sta stable. That, that's what I remember hearing back in the past. I mean, and then they can't be on residential property, four by eight, they can only be yard signs. Would this be a op good opportunity to use the city's application to <laughs> <laughs> cite a potential violation? <laughs> we'll turn that over to code compliance tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and just because I'm the newbie, November 15th, what are we doing? We'll be here. But it's a round table, so. Just a new oh, it's just announcing. Oh, oh, just, okay. Just, just announcing. Now, staff, I see there's nothing in December. Is that correct right now this, at this time? Well, the deadline for, de for December hasn't come up yet. Okay. I just want to make sure. I, there was nothing that I saw in there. That's why I was. Okay, this meeting is adjourned at 742.